All right, welcome to today's talk. Today, we're going to talk about C.S. Lewis and his book, The Four Loves. We're just going to introduce it today, and I'm going to make some follow-up videos getting deeper into the text. I think I've actually, I think I've actually done this like three times. I have a really bad habit of making videos and not editing them. Editing is not my superpower. If you're watching this, you probably think that making videos is not my superpower, and I agree with you, but editing is even worse. So I'm going to make myself finish this and edit it and post the bloody thing. So I'll talk about C.S. Lewis real quick before I get into just the introduction to this book. C.S. Lewis is one of my all-time favorite authors. I find him fascinating. Very intelligent man extremely broad in scope off the top of my head i don't remember the numbers but when i was getting when i was doing the research on the podcast for this series i'll put a link in the description for that if you're interested um i think i read that the narnia series has published over something like 100 million copies worldwide and that's just unbelievable to me c.s lewis also is really interesting because he published both fiction and nonfiction. so and both his fiction and his nonfiction is very well known. Although, interestingly, I found a lot of people who have read one or the other don't know that they don't know they're related. So I've known a lot of people who read the Narnia series and they don't really know it, C.S. Lewis, or they know about Mere Christianity, the screw tape letters, and they don't know that he wrote um, not just fiction, but he even wrote science fiction. So very interesting guy. There are some challenges with reading Lewis, especially with the nonfiction, not so much with the fiction. And just as a non-related aside, if you've never read the Narnia series, they're fantastic. So even if you're, even they're, they're kids' stories, but it doesn't matter. If you've never read them, I highly recommend them. They will, and don't just read the first book. If you're going to read them, read them all. It's, um, they're thought-provoking, they're good, they're entertaining, and they'll probably surprise you if you follow it all the way through. Now, some challenges that I've run into with Lewis is one with his nonfiction is the intended audience. I think, I don't think he foresaw, I don't know how he, he could have foreseen anything that he published. A hundred million copies is a lot, okay? I don't think he foresaw that. And I don't think he even really considered to any great extent that books he wrote would be read in another country across the ocean, something like 50 years after he passed away, more than 50 years after he passed away. And I certainly don't blame him for that, but I just, it's a factor because I, I think he, when he wrote a lot of his books, his intended audience was kind of a narrow audience. And that can make it a little bit harder to understand. Some of that is a source material. Some of his nonfiction was transcribed from lectures that he gave. And if he was giving a lecture, it was to an audience that was probably familiar with him. They were probably familiar with the subject he was talking about. That is much different than preparing something for a broad audience. Now, I don't think you run into that with mere Christianity because he intended mere Christianity for a broad audience. Um, that was originally a radio broadcast. But some of his other books, they were a lot more narrow in scope, and it can make them just kind of challenging to read. Part of that, I think, because his intended audience was an audience that was familiar with whatever the subject was, sometimes he will reference other authors. And the assumption is that the audience is familiar with the authors he's talking about. So sometimes he doesn't go into very much detail. Sometimes he doesn't even give their full name or mention the, the book or the poem that he's talking about. And that can make him a little bit hard to follow sometimes. And the last thing is just, um, I feel C.S. Lewis was a very intelligent man. I don't think he tried to use overly complicated language, but between being highly educated and living in a much different time, and some of it's probably just being English, his language was a lot different than what people use today. Honestly, I think today language has sort of intentionally been dumbed down. I myself, shamefully, grew up in an era when the, the single word dude was a complete sentence. And I cannot tell you how much I despise it when I revert to that. But it happens at times. I think if you're going to read Lewis, and I encourage you to, a dictionary is your friend. When you, when you find a word that, and you know you don't know what it means, go look it up. It'll help you understand what he's talking about. I really like Merriam-Webster. Merriam-Webster, I use it a lot. The Four Loves. Um, this was published in 1960, if I did my fact-checking correctly. This was about three years before he passed away at the age of 65. I believe he passed away from some kind of kidney issues. 
but I'm not 100% on that. This is a really interesting book. It's interesting in the first place, but if you think about it in the context of this was a very intelligent man, a very educated man, I think a guy who was used to having very intelligent conversations with other very intelligent and educated people, and towards the end of his life, he was examining the subject of love. I find that fascinating. I think, and love is something people think about a lot in healthy ways and unhealthy ways, but I just find it really interesting that at that point in his life, he sat down and he was trying to sort of organize his thoughts about a subject that he he kind of realized he had some questions about. He talks about how when he started the book, he had the idea of gift love and need love And he had strong opinions about both those categories and what they meant. But as he explored the subject and thought about it, he actually came to reevaluate his views on both those subjects and their relationship to each other. The title of The Four Loves is dealing with the fact that there's a couple different layers to this. One is, in English, we tend to use the word like and love interchangeably. So someone might say they love their iPad. You do not love your iPad. You might like your iPad, but you cannot love your iPad. If you feel very strongly that you do, seek psychological help. Because that should not be a thing. But he talks about how in English, like and love are used interchangeably and inappropriately. And it, it dumbs language down. When we get really nonspecific with our language, it doesn't make communication easier. The other aspect of this is he talks about how in the Greek language, there are four different words that mean love, and they refer to specific types of love. We'll get into more detail about those in later videos. Whereas English, we use love very broadly, and I think that causes problems. For now, I will say that the four types of love translated into English are affection, friendship, eros, and charity. In his book, he's got a separate chapter on each. It's a great book. I encourage you to read it. The last thing I'll say about that for this part is even though those are four distinct types of love, they do overlap and they work with each other. They don't always overlap. His definition of what he called gift love is a self-sacrificing love or works done for others. The example he uses from the text is of a man who works and saves his money the benefit family that will come along after he has passed on. So someone who is doing things intentionally for people that he's never going to meet. That's an example of gift love. We could pick other ones, but that's what he gives in the text. The example he gives of need love in that same section of the text is expressed as a frightened child running to his or her mother. Okay, so all I wanted to do today was introduce that, and then I'm going to make some other videos, and I will edit this and post it so that I have to. So, uh, the last thing I'm going to say is just an interesting quote from the text. He points out that if all we mean by our love is a craving to be loved, we are in a very deplorable state. All right, that's all for today. Now I'm going to do the part that I hate, which is edit this video. And you should go read a book.